So welcome to what's new in Access Control. It's the spring 2016 edition. Uh, we do these at least yearly, sometimes more so. Kind of bring everyone up to date on what the current trends are in Access. Kind of what to expect and what to see. So first things first, uh, even though they're not new per se, we're seeing lots more wireless and Wi-Fi locks. Um, not only in terms of, of new products, new hardware, but expanded integrations with existing systems. Uh, the goal is, you know, presumably if it's uh, on the door, if it's wireless, you're not having to run, you know, infrastructure to the door, power and data. Um, it's more unitized. It's easier to hang. It's easier to include in a system, and therefore the cost is lower. Um, the total cost of adding that door into an access system is lower, and that, that tends to be the net effect or interest in wireless and Wi-Fi locks. We're adding more doors to existing systems. And really, the three major players, uh, we see ASA, Allegion, and Salto, uh, you know, in a review of most major access control providers, it's really one of these three. Uh, sometimes all three uh, of these platforms that are supported. Uh, you know, so if we're going to call something big three, it's these names: Asa, Legion, and Salto. Uh, really, you know, Asa and Legion are no no strangers, they're not new on the scene in North America especially. A legion used to be called the Ingersoll Rand and uh, a lot of the the brands, the child brands of legion, names like Schlage for example, have been in the North American and world markets for a long time. Um, so, you know, here it is, the big three, you'll, you'll kind of see more and more systems kind of hitch their wagons to these brands. Uh, at least that's the, the current trend. Now, of those three, uh, the name you're most likely least familiar with is Salto. Uh, Salto um, began life. Uh, they, they currently are headquartered in Europe, which you're, if you're not from the European region, if you're from North America, Salto may be an uncommon name. Uh, you may not know a lot about them. Well, they have a platform called Solace uh, that really, again, a lot of mainstream vendors, uh, not only VMS vendors, but access providers are integrating with. So uh, you'll see Salto Solace be mentioned, uh, Allegiant. Again, with the, uh, the sub-brand or the child brand of Schlage has introduced a new wireless platform. And they've had the AD series, uh, AD series for a number of years. It's not a new offering, but their new offering is called Schlage NDE. And uh, the key value to NDE right now is low price, low cost. Uh, you know, we're seeing already signs of, um, by all means, simplified lock sets, uh, you know, cylindrical prep lock sets only right now, but, you know, they're, they're inexpensive. They're less than $500. Uh, we're seeing uh, the trend follow that more and more access providers will be or are integrating with Schleg NDE. So don't confuse uh, the AD series with NDE. They're not the same. Uh, they're two totally different series that just happen to be sold by the same company. And then John is saying, uh, what are the overall limitations to wireless locks? Uh, good question. Let me bring uh, a general slide up. Limitations. Uh, a lot of people in the past have pointed to a lack of comfort 
with sending things like access credential information over the air. Um, you know, their uh, cyber security or information security is a point of uneasiness with many. Now, I'm not going to say that's justified because I think most wireless and Wi-Fi lock products today do encrypt. Uh, they encrypt, you know, to 128-bit AES uncommonly. Uh, some even do 256-bit encryption. Uh, really, uh, you know, it's kind of more of a fear, uncertainty, and doubt mode that wireless is less secure. People are worried about hacking their access locks. So whether or not we kind of hold our nose at that and say it's unjustified, it is what it is, right? It's still a very commonly cited obstacle. But there are other more practical limitations. Uh, again, wireless locks don't always support uh, the full scope of functions you get through a hardwired access door. Uh, things like lockdown, you know, where I push a button on one screen and all my doors are instantaneously locked down uh, because of latency or you know partial feature implementation. You don't always get the full scope of functions you do with hardware doors or what I would say controller driven doors. Uh, another thing would be, uh, you know, wireless is great and not needing to run power is great as well. But that does mean that you have batteries you have to maintain and replace on those lock sides. Um, and you know, a lot of people kind of, you know, shrug their shoulders and say, oh, shucks, you know, how, how bad can it be? Well, Keep in mind that batteries, uh, that the lifespan of a set of batteries is inversely proportional to how busy that door is, which means that the more you use an opening, the more uh, a wireless opening is used, the less time the batteries will last. And so, uh, say what you will, you know, replacing a set a batteries in a wireless door is not always the the quickest thing to happen and it's definitely not the cheapest uh, you know it's really bad when your door goes offline because the batteries die and then even moreover you know continually shelling out money uh, you know for replacement batteries is not very popular so again th those may be pragmatic issues, uh, but certainly, you know, they're not easy to solve, a lot of them, whether it's, uh, you know, buyer culture or, you know, a pragmatic issue with power supply, whatever it is, uh, there are obstacles, wireless locks, Wi-Fi locks have to overcome. All right, so we talked about, you know, kind of the, uh, the new Schlage NDE platform, now, uh, you may be asking, you know, this is great, and it'd be great if IPVM put together posts, kind of uh, profiling each of these series. Well, we're doing just that. I'm doing just that. There is a series of wireless and Wi-Fi lock profiles coming up. And we've dabbled in this in the past. Uh, you know, if you search the site, <coughs> excuse me, You'll find uh, previous reports on a Perio from ASA or, you know, the 80 series from the Legion. But uh, we're kind of giving these a renewed focus, um, a new series of post. <coughs> excuse me. Updating uh, readers on the relative pros and cons, just like John's question here. And then divulging things like cost. A lot of, uh, a lot of times, even basic things like cost is kind of hard to find, uh, you know, on the internet. Uh, it, it takes some effort to kind of know what you're looking at and how cost applies. So certainly our new profile series 
uh, we'll, we'll kind of make that easy for readers. All right, so the second big trend is power over Ethernet. Uh, you may find this somewhat laughable if you've used PoE for a long time in the video surveillance act. And it's not a new thing even in access. What we are saying, though, is that use of PoE at the door is greatly increasing. And we're talking, you know, uh, 20 plus new products, whether it's locks or controllers or sensors, all taking advantage of PoE out the door. Um, now, again, PoE by itself is not new. It's not a new thing to many end users, uh, integrators, or even manufacturers, but applying it to access hasn't always been, uh, you know, a common thing. Uh, with any technology, you know, if you envision access control as a very conservative, uh, very hesitant type of market, you know, things like PoE really represent cutting edge technology, and that always carries some risk. Well, we're finally seeing that incumbent providers not only are accepting PoE, but expanding use, again, at the door. It's passed the sniff test. It's been in the market long enough now. Uh, use is increasing. And that's, you know, kind of a welcome thing because uh, there are many integrators that install cameras exclusively using PoE, yet they still use uh, redundant or external linear power supplies for access. Uh, we're going to see, again, not only with... Uh, the IP convergence happening, but things like PoE that are a subset of going IP will become more prevalent. All right, and then biometrics. Uh, let's talk about biometrics. Now, I almost felt bad including this because if you read any two-bit article from a trade magazine, they always mention biometrics is being up and coming. You know, it's the next big thing. Well, I don't want you to think that, uh, that I'm just throwing this out there because it's buzzy. Uh, I want to bring this to you with some fact behind it. We're seeing uh, not only an increased interest in biometrics from end users, but there are new biometric products that are hitting the market that haven't been in the market before. Uh, maybe a good, the best example is high resolution fingerprint imaging. Okay. And this in contrast to existing technologies, you, you know, place your finger on contact with a sensor. Uh, this is completely contact free, no contact required. Uh, if you went to IC, you saw, you know, uh, examples, iOS, their ANDI or ANDI OTG, which stands for on the go. Uh, it's a walkthrough fingerprint sensor and it looks like this. User kind of presents their hand in this notch and a camera essentially takes a high resolution picture of their fingers. <coughs> Excuse me, and then based on that image alone, that image is compared with a template information and users are authenticated or verified based on that image. Again, you know, if you talk to it, we talk to AOS and they really, uh, you know, claim things like, well, it's more hygienic, Users, you know, if they have some kind of transmittable disease, things like uh, flu or cold, you know, if they're not spreading germs by sharing a common fingerprint sensor, you know, it's really high throughput, you know, uh, the process of walking through uh, this read is a matter of not even breaking stride by the user. 
Uh, the user doesn't even have to slow down to be read. Uh, so they, they're offering really high throughput numbers, you know, 50 people per minute. Um, you know, the advantages, the upsides uh, for some classic problems in the biometric market are being answered, especially in the, the fingerprint market through this uh, visual inspection of prints. Now, AOS is not the only product or the only vendor offering this, uh, you know, Morpho. Uh, they have their own business line devoted to this thing. Uh, Morpho Track and Morpho Waves Tower. Uh, we have a post upcoming, same type thing. It's completely contactless. Uh, there is no uh, contact needed from the user. It is a little bit different. Uh, the user can't simply just, uh, you know, keep their stride. They, they do have to break stride somewhat and wave their hand under the notch in the tower. Um, you know, so overall, you know, theoretical throughput could be lower. But Morpho says, you know, doing it this way ensures higher quality of read, uh, better you know, verification, higher accuracy of reads are possible with our product. Um, so we have a post on that upcoming. Uh, next week, I think uh, we'll release the post on this. Either one of these solutions are not cheap. Okay, whether it's the AOS or the Mo Morpho product, you know, we're talking 10000 plus dollars for a single reader. Uh, that's a hard sell, you know, if you want to uh, deploy these throughout a business, you're not going to be able to control every door with one of these options, okay? But sure enough, you know, whenever it comes to these high volume, high throughput pressure points where, you know, historically we may need to mount, you know, multiple cord readers. Uh, you know, these products kind of accommodate higher flows to begin with. It's an interesting trend, certainly one that we'll see develop. And then John has a question, Morpho is fingerprint or finger or hand vein? Well, Morpho does a lot of different uh, form factors, a lot of different uh, authentication factors. Uh, they do both finger uh, you know, contact finger and contactless finger. And that's the difference with Morpho Wave is that it's purely contactless. It's imaging, right? And then they do veins and, you know, finger, or I'm sorry, face rack. Um, they do other factors as well. So Morpho is a, a, a very big company, a lot of different biometric solutions. All right, so let's talk about the interoperability in standards trends. You know, these are things like uh, like OnVIF Profile C. Uh, you'll remember uh, OnVIF, and they kind of you know had a huge impact in the video surveillance world. Uh, kind of you know took off had a very aggressive growth curve, made big strides for interoperability in video, released uh, several years ago a profile devoted to access control on VIF Profile C. Uh, again, in contrast to video, where very commonly it's on VIF Profile S, on VIF Profile C was solely devoted to getting controllers to speak in a standard way with management software head-ins. Well, since this launch, you know, uh, we only have really two vendors that have designed products, uh, either controllers or head-in software that conforms to OnVIF Profile C. We've uh, even had some vendors drop off. At the last time you looked at OnVIF C, 
was a couple of years ago, you would have seen Axis uh, with their A1001 controller, but you might have also seen Vidsys, which is a PSIM provider. Well, over the years, uh, Vidsys pulled back from Unvif Profile C, and uh, now we see this new player or, or new entrant, Hamatom. Uh, again, uh, they are a software provider. Uh, they don't manufacture hardware. So right now, Unvif Profile C is largely, uh, I, don't, I don't want to call it dead, but certainly stale. Uh, we're not seeing it take off like Unvif Profile S has in the past. It is what it is. Uh, it's going nowhere fast. And that kind of is what you need to carry with you. Unvif C going nowhere. Now, uh, it's Unvif is not the only standards game in town, not the only person, or I'm sorry, not the only organization producing standards. Uh, PSIA released an access control standard in the same bank. Uh, you know, their interest was standardizing the way hardware talks to software. And while, you know, success has been better, uh, it's really not that much better that we call this a winner. Uh, I do believe PSI access uh, maybe instead of one or two has four or five partners producing hardware that meet the standard. Uh, but again, it's not very well recognized in the market. Uh, even if you read, uh, you know, supporting members spec sheet, they don't loudly proclaim BSI conformance or compliance. So really the end result is that it's not much better. Now, undeterred by the lack of interest, uh, Unvif is going to release a new profile in Atlas. It doesn't replace Profile C. It's in addition to Profile C called Unvif Profile A. And right now they're circulating uh, the release candidate specification. Uh, you know, they, they kind of want to circulate this among the members kind of either make changes or rubber stamp it. It's not been officially ratified yet. That's coming. Uh, any day now, uh, we expect to see it. Now, the goals of Envifa are ambiguous, at least right now ambiguously stated. It's a move beyond basic door management, and uh, it intends to standardize and simplify the integration between access control and VMS. So, you know, rather than view this with skepticism, it's more of like, uh, you know, we, we have to be cautious uh, to see how the market receives Unvif Profile A. Uh, I'm not sure uh, what the reception will be like. Again, I, I'm not very positive. Uh, we're not hearing vendors talk about this with any kind of excitement, but it's a wait and see at this point. Unvif C is going nowhere, PSI not really much better, and Unvif A is coming, uh, so we'll see where it takes us. Now, if there is one, I'll call it a success story uh, with, with access interoperability. It's OSDP. And again, um, you know, doesn't encompass a very broad part of the access uh, market, you know, the access system. It's very specific within uh, what it defines. And the way I'll pitch this to you or present this to you is that OSDP intends to replace Wigan as the format that governs how readers talk to controllers. Okay, Weekend is a, a serial communication protocol that's been around forever, right? Uh, very widespread use adoption. It's very common to mix and match 
uh, controllers with somebody else's readers entirely, but yet using Weekend, they communicate. Well, again, OSDP uh, replaces that. No, it does offer some very practical advantages, things like uh, bi-directional communication. Uh, we can just pushes data from the controller to the reader. Okay, that's all it does. It's one way. Well, with the OSDP, it's bi-directional. Uh, sure enough, you know, the controller pushes, or I'm sorry, the reader pushes information to the controller but the controller can push information back to the reader. Uh, things like, uh, you know, even wellness checks. Uh, the controller wants to know if the reader is still on the wall. You know, has it been knocked free or tampered with? Well, if the controller, you know, pings the reader, is a healthy return value, uh, you know, bounce back? Does it come back? Uh, not possible with weekend. Uh, it is possible using OSDP, and uh, even before IC West, uh, there was several big names that announced uh, adoption of OSDP. I think uh, maybe the biggest name was Software House. You know, they've very recently announced uh, support. <coughs> Excuse me. And then Jason says, can you touch on Bluetooth BLE pros and cons? Uh, the adoption level, uh, success stories, uh, sure enough. Uh, even though I don't specifically call out BLE or NFC or any of those protocols in this presentation, uh, I can certainly talk about them. I think when it comes to... Uh, you know, market success or, or uptake, it's going to be BLE. Uh, you know, NFC had an early and maybe strong start. You had names like HID Global uh, and therefore ASA really throwing their, their branding and their, their product development weight behind NFC. Well, uh, there was a couple of problems with that. There is a couple of problems with that. Uh, first things first, you know, being able to use an NFC credential on a phone is not just a, a simple task. And there's a lot of variation that goes into a, what kind of phone is being used, uh, where do I buy the NFC credential, you know, how do I administrate that as an end user? Um, for a long time, Apple didn't support any kind of NFC. And when we're talking about using smartphones as credentials, uh, Apple plays a big role in, in that picture. You know, they have 40% uh, of the world market in smartphones, right? So if they don't support it, then what do those users who carry iPhones do? And because of this, uh, you know, BLE, or Bluetooth, low energy, really gained uh, early steam. And that steam is kind of carried forward. Uh, you know, we're seeing increasingly new products or, or existing vendors incorporate BLE into their platforms. Uh, things like, uh, you know, I want to say uh, Prevo last year announced, uh, you know, mobile credentialing that totally ignored NFC altogether. Um, we're seeing BLE as those chips are commonly built into every phone set. You know, Apple, Android, Windows, whoever it is. Uh, we're seeing BLE being used more readily. Uh, in fact, it, you know, it's easier for, for many, for me to give you the new products that don't support BLE than maybe the ones that do. It's very common to support BLE. 
<coughs> excuse me. And then Eric is saying breaking up. Uh, we're losing a lot of info. Will this webinar be accessible afterward? Yeah, sorry about that. I mean, I'm sure me coughing isn't helping either. Uh, but sure enough, uh, this is being recorded and will be posted later. So let's move on to business trends. Uh, you know, <clears throat> the question is, in contrast with video, is access safe from China? Now, I don't mean to, uh, you know, capitalize or create fear or doubt or insult anyone. I just mean to... Uh, you know, kind of uh, simplify the idea. A lot of people are worried about Chinese competition undermining the access market. And it's important to know that, you know, as big as access control is, there is no high vision or DAWA access outside of Asia and then, you know, dot, 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 yet. What I'm saying there. It's certainly if you review DAWA or Hike Vision's product portfolio, you will find access control product. But typically those are limited for distribution and use in sport in the Asian market. I'm not finding, you know, DAWA North America or Hike Vision North America uh, offer access products yet. So Specifically, with those names, High Vision and Dawa, uh, you know, that's a low-cost, high-volume type offering. A lot of people are fearful that, you know, these names will wreck the access market, the traditional pricing and margins and markup model in access. We're not seeing that be pronounced outside of Asia just yet. And there, there really, you know, I'll, I'll go over the barriers for that. Uh, you know, it's not going to be an easy thing. Not to say it, it can't happen or it won't happen. It's just that three very important obstacles need to be broached first. One just is in the codes. <coughs> Excuse me, in the specifications, right? There's one aspect of uh, access control in North America and Europe and many parts of the world that is uh, heavily legislated, it's this. You know, it's, it's one thing to design a camera that can be used to endanger life safety really in any way. Uh, but it's something totally different to engineer a product that potentially can be used to lock people in buildings. And that, you know, that code uh, variation alone means development is slower. <coughs> Excuse me. And even within mainstream access providers, a lot of times they offer regional variations in their versions uh, based on, you know, code compliance. Especially with things like door hardware or standalone locks. Uh, it takes time to break into all areas. Right now, again, it's in Asia. It's not really bleeding over into anywhere else. And then along with code variation is, uh, you know, I'll just call it straight up product variation. Doors and openings are relatively complex uh, installations, right? They're, they're deceptively complex. And there's a lot of variation from one door to the next. Now, getting with, with camera development, it's somewhat simplified. Even though we have wide variation in scenes, we can design a handful of features to kind of broach the gap in all of that application. But it's much more difficult with the openings. You know, we did different doors, different door widths, different door heights. We have gates. Uh, you know, we have outdoor. We have indoor. You know, there, there's lots of mechanical interaction that must take place 
at a door. <coughs> and as a result, uh, just the product variation alone. You know, for, again, Hike Visner or Dawa to announce a full suite of products for the access market, it's going to be difficult. And, uh, you know, it, it will take time. And then maybe the third barrier, and this one is palpable, uh, and you may even share it, is that there is a, you know, I'll call it an end-user barrier to uh, buy into something that's unproven. It's one thing to, uh, you know, pick a camera, again, that, that is cheap and looks good and is recommended to you. But when it comes to changing over an enterprise access control system, there's a lot of skepticism about new product, uh, about product with unproven track records. Uh, even within, you know, the access markets now, you're still a new access company if you've been doing this for five or ten years. You know, you're still kind of the new kid on the block if you've been doing it a decade. So with that in mind, keep in mind the names like uh, Dawa or White Vision won't be able to make inroads, inroads quickly because end users are more resistant to risk. Uh, they don't want to accept something that could potentially uh, endanger people because it's unproven. Uh, whether it's fair or unfair, uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, the skepticism in the market is absolutely there in a big reason. All right, and I think um, that moves us to a Q and A time. Do a time check here. We're about 40 minutes past. Are there any other Q&A questions that I can answer? No, Jason asked about uh, BLE. I'll give you a recent example of someone using BLE. And if you do have questions, go ahead and, and um, chime in now. There's a new startup. Um, I have no idea how successful they may be. Uh, they're based out of Brooklyn, in New York. Uh, here they are, the Brooklyn Access Startup. Now, Startups in access are nothing new. You know, we've seen uh, this unfold or take place. Names like Lockdron come to mind. Uh, Kisi is different. And the reason why they're different is they're aiming for, I'll say, commercial markets. Uh, sure, they do consumer stuff but they're aiming for small business. And that really is kind of a differentiating a quality. Now, do they have a fully fleshed out platform? No. Um, does it have the same features as a traditional incumbent access platform? No way. Um, they're still very new. <coughs> Excuse me, they're still trying to navigate their own startup barriers, but it's worth noting that KC by default uh, support Bluetooth low energy. Again, um, you know, they don't support NFC at all, uh, but because of the lower licensing or no licensing in using BLE, uh, they, they've embraced it from the get-go. So again, um, you know, not to, to amplify this one example as being too big, 
but we're seeing this, you know, where new providers tend to gravitate towards the BLE, and that's the end of the conversation. If we ask them, if I ask them, what about SPAR for NFC? It's always on the roadmap, or it's always less urgent. A uh, really interesting company, uh, made in Brooklyn by a couple of German expats. Uh, you know they're very, they're very serious not to uh, trivialize their effort. Uh, they're giving it a good go. And then John is saying, uh, do you expect the adaptation of a unified access and video solution will make a difference? anytime soon? Uh, it's a good question and certainly we're seeing uh, a preference at least at, at the high end, the middle to high end of the commercial market uh, prefer a unified solution. Uh, even for medium-sized enterprises uh, they want video integration with their access system and because of that uh, names like Genetech and, and Milestone and even on the access side, names like S2 and even Linnell uh, or Software House uh, to a lesser degree are, are getting attention because of the way they combine video with access features. Uh, another one that they could change is a visual one. Um, Everyone always thinks IPVM just rips on a visual one because that's what we do. Well, that's not the case. Um, you know, the fair assessment of a visual one access is that it has promise. Now, it's good uh, as far as a hardware design in an access platform. Where's the weakest, surprisingly, is how it integrates to video. Um, I expect that to get better and therefore increase the appeal over time. Now, keep in mind, having a unified interface will never be a killer feature uh, for everyone in the market, especially at the low end or you know the small business market. Uh, very seldom do they have full-time operators or even part-time operators looking at the video surveillance system, much less the access control system. Now, if you have four doors and ten employees, you're probably not going to be interested in unified video and access, uh, especially if it costs more. You just don't want your access system to break. And you want it to be easy to use, right? That's your main criteria there. So, you know, the the tightness emerging between video and access is definitely there. It's just more segmented. It's more fragmented in areas of the market. And again, I think whenever we talk about things like, uh, you know, interoperability and standards, you know, if those pick up steam, it's going to be because of those markets. It's not going to be because, you know, small users or small installers or integrators demand it. It's going to come from the higher end. All right, great question. What other questions uh, do we have? Did I miss any? No, overall, um, I think pricing is coming down. You know, certainly pricing pressure is there in, in the access market. Uh, let's not kid ourselves. But, uh, in contrast with video, it's not nearly as strong. Again, we're we're selling cameras for you know eighty bucks these days, right? Access control certainly the price is coming down with things like Wi-Fi 
and wireless locks. But the margins, the markup, is uh, more preserved. All right. Well, uh, like I had on the last slide here, uh, my email address, let me bring that up. It is brian at ipvm.com. You, at any time, are free to email me. If I can help, uh, shoot me an email. Uh, you know, whether it's a diagnose this access problem or, you know, something that you're having an issue with, you don't want it to be public. Uh, you know, if I can help even with with uh, discrete issues, then email me. And even for general questions, uh, we are open and motivated to help our members at any time. So I encourage you to do that. All right, well, I'll tell you what. If that's the case, then how about we wrap this one up, and uh, I'll see everyone on the site. Have a good day.